Oh, all right. Okay, so uh, I want you to notice uh, up on the board, we have a final exam uh, that, is, uh, that is coming up off, uh, next Wednesday, uh, December the 9th. Uh, watch out for this one. Uh, you know, it just so happens that uh, the way the finals, uh, the finals actually land, uh, our final exam time does not actually happen during our regular class time. So make sure you put this into your phone or your calendar or something uh, that our final exam actually starts at 10 a.m. Uh, next Wednesday. And then we have an hour and a half uh, to go in and, uh, and take that. I'll try to send out a reminder, uh, but um, this has been printed on the final exam schedule. So just make sure you put it somewhere uh, so you don't end up showing up at 11 o'clock uh, because as soon as uh, 1130 comes, uh, I'm collecting the exams and I'm taking them and grading them uh, and getting your final grades put in uh, so we can, uh, we can get this whole thing wrapped up. All right, so uh, 10 o'clock. All right, so uh, the final exam uh, is uh, going to consist of going to be the same format uh, as it was last time, uh, the first exam. Uh, so uh, there's going to be some true false questions. Uh, there are going to be about 10 of those. Uh, and then uh, there are going to be uh, some multiple choice questions. There are going to be approximately 30 of those. I don't have the entire thing uh, finished yet, but it's going to be right around 40 questions, uh, give or take a question or two, uh, just like the first exam. All right, so about 10 true false and about uh, 30 multiple choice. Make sure you bring a lead pencil with you on Wednesday. We're going to be doing the bubble sheet again, right, like we did last time. And again, it will not accept pen. Uh, I will uh, not have pencils available. Uh, so make sure you bring a pencil or two with you. Also, make sure you bring a regular calculator with you as well. I will not allow cell phones to be used as calculators, and I will not allow cell phone or uh, calculators to be shared between students. Doesn't have to be anything, you know, fancy. Just something that will add, subtract, multiply, and divide. But make sure you have a regular calculator with you. All right. This exam is going to be. It is not going to be comprehensive. Uh, it is going to be just a second exam over the supply and demand chapters, uh, which is three four, five, and then our elasticity chapter, uh, which is chapter six, right? So it is not comprehensive. It's only over supply and demand and elasticity. So your method of study for this exam, uh, number one, the notes. We've got a lot of graphing, a lot of analysis uh, through these four chapters. So make sure you go back to it and you look at your notes really, really well. Uh, secondly, any uh, handouts that we have done, and actually there are going to be a couple of them that we're going to reference uh, going through uh, the review. So make sure you look at uh, the shortage surplus worksheet, uh, the supply and demand uh, handout that we did. We had, uh, had some uh, uh, questions due off of that one. Uh, there was a PowerPoint, right, that we did some examples on and so on. So there's like three or maybe even four uh, worksheets that you have to look at. And then <laughs> any, uh, any material out of chapters three, four, five, and six that overlap my notes, that is also fair game for the, uh, for the uh, final as well. Uh, again, keep in mind, I don't go back in and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask you some about some obscure, obscure form of elasticity that we didn't talk about in class, right? But uh, if we talked about elasticity of demand, uh, elastic, inelastic, and so on, and it's in chapter six, then you are responsible for that material as well. All right, so there is the, uh, there's the general logistics of the final exam. For those of you who came in late, again, notice right here, uh, the final exam is starting at 10 a.m., not our regular class time, all right? So, uh, so just make sure you're on time. All right, so real quickly, let's just kind of go through and recap what we have done uh, through these particular chapters. So first of all, we went in and we, uh, we defined the demand uh, curve. And so we went in and we started talking about how buyers are going to go in and respond to changes in price. So we made the assumption that the quantity demanded is going to be some function of the price of the product. 
And ultimately what ended up happening was we went in, we took some data right out of this entire thing, and we ended up graphing a demand curve that looks something like this. All right, which means that by the time we got done, we found out that price and quantity demanded have a negative relationship. So make sure, number one, you understand what a negative relationship means, right? The variables are moving in different directions. And then uh, also understand what we mean by the law of demand, right? So as price goes up, quantity demand goes down. As price goes down, quantity demand goes up. All right, so that was the derivation and the idea of that negative relationship. Then we set that aside and we went in and we started talking about uh, the supply or the production side of the economy. So we went in and we said, well, if price is going to affect consumers' behavior, then price is probably also going to affect suppliers' behavior as well. So we went in and made the assumption that the quantity that a seller would be willing and able to sell is going to be some function of the price of the product. And so we went in and uh, in our particular example, uh, I think we had the refrigerator or freezer example, and we used brute force intuition, uh, talking about what all the supplier knows about their business and so on. And we eventually derived an upward sloping supply curve looking something like that. So we then discussed that price and quantity supplied have a positive relationship. So again, know what a positive relationship means and which direction those variables are going to be moving. All right, once we got done deriving the demand and supply curves, then we went in and we drew an entire market. So we brought the demanders in with everything that they, they know about uh, their uh, taste and preferences and income and so on. We brought in the suppliers with everything they know about their businesses, profit motivation and so on. And we, uh, we showed where equilibrium was going to be, right? And that's gonna be right there. So in equilibrium, there is one equilibrium price, we call it peanut. And when we are in equilibrium, we know that the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity that is being demanded. So buyers are willing and able to buy exactly what sellers are willing and able to sell. All right, so we define what equilibrium was and, uh, and why that is important for us to be at that particular point in the market. All right. From there, then we ask the question, all right, well, if we've got a graph and I go in and I give you a number down here of you know, the, uh, the equilibrium quantity, you know, that's all well and good, but how do we know exactly what that equilibrium quantity actually is? So we went in and we, uh, we said that, well, we have this discipline called econometrics. And so we can go in and we can figure out what the equations are for the demand and the supply curve. So we said, what if we do that and we find out that the quantity demanded in the market is whatever, 30 minus 5P, and the quantity supplied in the market is whatever, 50 plus 3P. So if we, uh, if we go in and those equations will always be given to you, right? That's something that, that is far beyond you know, what we are able to do in this class. But if those equations are given to you, be able to go in and set quantity demanded equal to quantity supplied and solve for your equilibrium price and quantity. All right, so we did a couple of those at least, uh, well, we, yeah, we did, did at least a couple of those in class. Uh, worked through one in class and at least had one, possibly even two. Uh, that we did as a quiz grade. I will guarantee you that there will be one of those uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the exam. All right, so uh, it's, it's good when you're going through your notes and you come up on something like this, you know, after you re review it in your notes, you know, take the equations, take them off on another sheet of paper, 
set them equal to each other, and then solve the thing. Right? And that way you have a, an example to follow uh, and in case you go in and you, know, you get stuck and, and you need some help with that. So you've got a couple of examples of that. All right, so that's how we go in and that's how we uh, derive our equilibrium price and our equilibrium quantity. Then we went in and started talking about shortages and surpluses. Because we said, you know, uh, we want the, the market to be in equilibrium, but there's always going to be these disturbances that are going to be running through these markets that's going to perturb the price either above or below equilibrium. So be able to uh, recognize and measure a shortage. So if the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied, you have a shortage. If the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded, then you have a surplus situation. So be able to work with shortages and surpluses in both graphical and tabular form. Graphical and tabular form. Do you guys have a, a, a worksheet? Does anybody have it handy, by the way? There was the shortage surplus worksheet uh, that we did. We actually did it in class, I think. And, um, the numbers up at the top. So, it's got a bit of a shortage, shortage of surplus. Thank you. <laughs> it looks like this, right? It's got the, uh, the chart of numbers up at the top. Uh, and then, uh, so you had to go in, then you had to draw like the market down at the bottom. Guys, it looks something like this. Hope you can see that, right? So uh, this is, uh, in fact, you have both situations uh, that you're looking at here. Uh, so you've got the tabular form up on the top. You know, when you pick a price and you see what the quantity of demand and the quantity of supply is, thank you. And then you went in and you uh, you drew the market, and then you were able to look and see, you know, at this certain price, is there a shortage? Is there a surplus? And what has to happen if we're out of equilibrium to get ourselves back into equilibrium, right? So that's going to be a very important worksheet to look at. Uh, to understand these shortages and surpluses. All right, so there's going to be, you know, five or six questions over shortages and surpluses. All right, from there, and up until that point, we had said nothing about government intervention up until that point in time. But then this is where we went in and added our price floors. Price floors. Uh, and price ceilings, price floors and price ceilings. So be able to work with price floors and price ceilings. Uh, know who price floors and price, first of all, know who price floors and price ceilings are supposed to protect, right? That's the most important, I think, part, partly most important part of this. So price floors uh, are designed to protect sellers in the market. Uh, price ceilings are designed to protect demanders from high prices. Right. And then uh, and then we went in and we worked. We did several examples uh, dealing with both price floors and price ceilings. Now, guys, I will tell you, I've said this all the way throughout the class. What's going to be important on this exam is graphing. Right. Be able to go off to the side and graph the situation. So if you go in right, and you're given uh, a situation right, that looks something like this, man, supply, uh, whatever, $3, $2, $5, right, so on and so forth. And then I go in and I say, uh, well, let's assume for the moment, uh, given this graph that you have, that the government goes in and installs a price floor at $5. 
Is there going to be a shortage, surplus, neither? What's going to happen in this market? So I would expect you to be able to go in, uh, draw your line across here, right? That's your floor at $5. And then keep in mind, a floor is something you can't go below. So that means that anything down here is in fact illegal, which means that the price of $3 to equilibrium price is an illegal price. And once you recognize that, then that means that the price now is $5. That would be quantity supplied here. That means quantity demanded is here. Uh, if quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded, then that creates a surplus in the market. All right, so I would expect you to be able to go in and graph those situations uh, and, uh, and be able to tell me, is there a shortage surplus or neither. All right, from there then, after we got talking, uh, done talking about floors and ceilings, uh, then we went in and made the distinction between changes in quantity demanded versus changes in demand. All right, so I expect by now uh, that you should know the difference between those two particular terms. The book also goes into detail uh, about talking about or describing the difference between changes in quantity demanded and changes in demand. All right. And then it was from there that we went in and we started talking about the actual shifting of the demand curve itself, right? So we now know uh, if you go in and we have a demand curve, now we're sloping something, something, something like that. We now mark it with a D naught after that. So we know if we say demand has increased, that that demand curve shifts out and to the right. If demand decreases, the demand curve shifts back into the left. Hopefully that's second nature by now. Same thing with the supply curve. All right, we have an upward sloping supply curve. So if we say we have had an increase in supply, then that means that supply curve has shifted out into the right. And if there's a decrease in supply, then that supply curve will shift back and to the left. Again, hopefully that is second nature by now. Now, right around this particular area, we started listing off the shifters, shifters of demand. And then we also had the shifters of supply, the shifters of demand and the shifters of supply. So there's pretty good size lists right under each one of those. And there's two ways that you're going to be tested on this. All right, the first way is I can go in and I can actually give you a graph. I can uh, give you a diagram of some kind. Let's just say it turns out to look something like this. All right, so uh, whatever. I go in and uh, boom, boom, and boom. Okay, so that's the diagram that you have on your, on your exam. And so then I would go in and ask you, which of the following could be responsible uh, for the graph above. All right, so you would look at this and you would clearly say, all right, whatever ha is happening here, it's a supply shifter. And whatever supply shifter it is, it is increasing supply. So once you recognize that, you go through A, B, C, D, and E and look for which of those factors that I have listed will specifically shift the supply curve out and to the right. There are two of these right on the exam. So you'll need to pick out which, which one of those would be responsible. The second way, uh, and there are, 
I want to say several questions on the exam like this would be like the ones that we did in class with that PowerPoint worksheet that I gave you. And also, uh, you have your supply and demand worksheet as well. The entire front page, right, is full of those types of problems. So uh, I believe one that we did was I gave you the setup of, uh, let's assume the economy is doing well and incomes are on the rise, right? What's going to happen to the price and quantity of cars? So if I give you that statement, then you should be able to go off to the side really quick, draw yourself a demand and supply analysis, and then look at the, uh, look at the description and say, all right, the economy is doing well, incomes are on the rise. Income is a demand shifter, and if income goes up, demand increases. So you would draw your demand curve, and then you can quickly conclude that the price of cars will increase and the quantity of cars will increase as well. Okay, so you'll have to go off to the side. Again, graph these. Uh, it will make it so much easier than trying to go out because it does, you know, takes 10 seconds to do the graph. Uh, the analysis is the part that I am going to be looking for in these particular questions. All right, so know your shifters and be able to apply those shifters or several, we, we spend a lot of time uh, on that in class. Also, after we got done with this, we talked about several policy situations, the active manipulation of either the demand or the supply curve. The one I want you to pay attention to, because we did, uh, I believe there was one over the agricultural market, illegal drugs and uh, the market for human organs, I believe is what we did. I want you to pay attention particularly to the market for illegal drugs, right? So we talked about what would happen in these markets if we strictly fight a supply side war. What will happen in these markets if we fight strictly a demand side war? So I want you to, uh, to understand that analysis that we did with illegal drugs. From there, we went in and we switched gears just a little bit and we started talking about elasticity. So we now, I want you to know what elasticity is. We're asking the question, how does quantity demanded change when price changes. That's the entire underpinning of elasticity. So once we got done you know, talking about that idea, I want you to be able to recognize a relatively elastic demand curve, right? One that is fairly you know, uh, shallow in nature and a relatively elastic, uh, inelastic, a relatively inelastic demand curve. So I would expect that you would be able to look at those and tell me whether it is elastic or inelastic. All right. Then we went in and we started actually doing the calculation. Well, just how much of a response is there to a change in price? So we had the percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price. Quantity is always on top, price is always on the bottom. I will already tell you there are two questions dealing with that particular formula. So be able to, if I tell you that the price of cars you know, increased by 3%, the quantity demanded declined by 5%, be able to plug numbers into that formula and calculate the elasticity. Also, given the numbers, so if I don't give you the percentages, if I actually give you numbers like a demand curve, right, or so on, be able to go in and calculate elasticity using the arc elasticity formula. So that's Q1 minus Q0, Q1 plus Q0 divided by two, and then P1 minus P0, P1 plus P0 divided by two. All right, I will guarantee you there are two questions 
using that particular formula as well. By the way, does anybody remember what is the very last step in any elasticity problem? The absolute value, very good. So always take the absolute value and then interpret your number. So we know if the elasticity of demand is greater than one, it's elastic. If the elasticity of demand is less than one, then it's inelastic. All right, so be able to uh, plug numbers into those formulas and then interpret whether it's elastic or inelastic. Oh, also know when you're dealing with elasticity that there are no units involved, right? It's just a number and specifically know that the elasticity of demand and slope are not the same thing, right? That's a very important concept. Uh, I, uh, I debunked that by actually going in and using the two examples that we did in class to show that elasticity values, even along a straight line demand curve, change, right? Slope doesn't, but elasticity does. So slope and elasticity are not the same thing. Okay, and then we finished out with the two extremes of demand analysis that actually happen in the real world. Uh, we have our perfectly inelastic demand curve and we have our perfectly elastic demand curve. So be able to recognize those two graphs and be able to interpret what these two graphs mean. So in other words, you know, if I were to ask you, you know, what, what, does, what does this say? And what this says is that regardless of what the price is, quantity demanded does not change, right? Quantity demanded stays, stays the same. So understand what those two graphs are telling you. And I believe that's where we left off, right? I believe that's it. Okay, very good. Questions. First of all, uh, let's tackle the exam part of it. Questions about the exam other than the answers. All right. Again, I reiterate 10 o'clock. Right. Make sure you bring a lead pencil. Make sure you bring a calculator. Um, long shot like review notes. Yes, you can. Very good. I believe we did on the first one, did we not? So you are allowed to use your notes, not your worksheets. Okay, uh, I will allow you to use the PowerPoint since I gave that out as notes, right? And you were, but the other worksheets, I, I'm not going to allow, but the rest of your notes, you're allowed to use. Yes. Now, saying that, I also have to put the caveat in. Uh, I, I want you to realize there's a lot of technical material here. So make sure that you study for this exam just like you would if you weren't going to use your notes, right? Because if you don't know how to use the formula, uh, if you don't understand uh, your, your supply and demand shifters to start, you're not going to be able to learn that in an hour and a half, right? So you're going to have to have an understanding before you come in. But then I want you to use your notes to say, oh, wait a minute, I thought, oh, that's right, you know, and, and you get yourself out of the bind. Right. And then you've got your formula uh, in front of you, you know, so you make sure that you get your numbers plugged in right and so on. But you have to know how to use the stuff before you walk in the door. OK, but you're allowed to use all your notes, not your worksheets. Any questions about the material? Are we good on that? OK, guys, I'm going to have uh, pretty much regular office hours. Of course, you know, exam times are kind of screwed up. Uh, but if you need help with anything, uh, send me an email, right? And then uh, we've, uh, you know, you've got that Zoom link, right? And, uh, and I can Zoom with you anytime during the day and answer any questions you might have. All right, so we'll see you next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Have a good weekend. Study hard, study often, and good luck on the rest of your finals. Jose and Adrian, do you guys know anything yet? Oh, um, I think it's oh thank you. Bit. For me, it was easier to yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr.